Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Voice of Faith, having your Bibles. Let's open them, please, to the book of Mark, chapter 14. Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. The last two weeks we looked at, uh, based on this verse here, Mark 14, 49, just a little over three years ago I was reading and this scripture really stood out at me. And God began to deal with me about some things that I've shared with you over the last two weeks about God's word being inspired, preserved, translated. And now we're looking at the fulfillment of Scripture. Mark 14 is the story of Jesus uh, being taken away. They're about to come and take him away to crucify him. And so he's allowing them to take him. And he says, I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not, but the Scriptures must be fulfilled. And that phrase really stood out at me. And and that phrase has always been really strong in my heart for the last three years that God is, has given that to me. And I have prayed that back to God many times since the Lord gave that to me. The scriptures must be fulfilled. We've talked about how that word must is the power word in this verse. He didn't say that they could be fulfilled or they should be. He said they must be fulfilled. And Jesus allowed them to take him away to crucify him for this reason that the scriptures would be fulfilled. He said they must be fulfilled. And then we use the scripture in Luke 24. And if you'll turn there, please. What scripture was that in Mark? Mark 14, 49. Mark 14, 49. I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then in Luke 24, 44, Jesus makes this statement after he's been raised from the dead. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things, please say all things. How much is all things? All. Nothing is left out of all. All things must, there's that power word again, must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. All things must be fulfilled. And he, and he breaks it down. He says, uh, in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And in that verse, the Lord really brought home to me the, the last two words concerning me that Jesus is the head. According to Ephesians chapter 2, Jesus is the head, and we are his body. So all things written concerning Jesus must be fulfilled, then all things concerning the church must be fulfilled. You and I are living in exciting times. I believe personally that the rapture of the church is in our lifetime. I believe it's real close. So every single scripture that's been given concerning the church, we are living in that time of it being fulfilled. Every promise God's ever given you, every verse of Scripture that He's made alive and real to you and God's promised you, you are living in the time of those things being fulfilled. Hallelujah. Now, I don't go by feelings, but just as I'm saying that, I just got a whole bunch of Holy Ghost goosebumps all up and down my backside. Glory to God. You and I are right on the edge of seeing God fulfill His Word to you and I. Hallelujah. You better get your sunglasses because the days ahead are looking bright. Glory to God. We are in for some awesome times. I know the world's going to be dark and it's going to get darker and it's going to get crazier. But for the people of God, we're going to shine bright. The power of God's going to be there in manifestation. The Spirit of God's going to move like we've never seen before. In fact, glory to God, I'll tell you this by the Spirit of God, the Bible says that we're going to experience the former and the latter rain all at one time. And the Bible says that all of the signs and wonders under the ministry of Moses was moderate. That was just a moderate outpouring, and you and I are in the time of fullness. We're going to see what Moses saw and greater than that. 
I read, I read Exodus and I'm thinking, man, the power of God's really showed up here with all this stuff. And the Bible calls that moderate. What, what days are we in for? Hallelujah. This is the time of things being fulfilled. And just, just as it is with Jesus, I really want to bring this home, just as it is with Jesus, it M-U-S-T, it must be fulfilled with the church. Aren't you glad you're a part of the church today? Amen. Hallelujah. The church, isn't, the church isn't right here. It's not the building. The church meets inside the building. The church is the people, the born-again believers, those that love Jesus and asked Him to be their Lord and Savior. We're the church, and the glory of God's going to be inside the building because we're going to bring it in with us. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I'm excited about that. I'm thankful for that. Jesus said, well, then at verse 45, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. He is the head, we are the body, but we must have our understanding opened up to us. Apart from the Holy Spirit, you'll not understand the Word of God, but thank God we have the Holy Spirit. You know, it wouldn't be, it, it'd be something, and I, it, it is, it's great. You, you think about, um, you think about, let me just real quick, let me borrow this book. Thanks. So here's a book that my brother's going to borrow from me. And so you're reading the book, right? You're reading the book, and you're reading the book, and you come across and you think, well, well I wish he had explained that better. Now, just what does that mean? And then all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door, and there he is. He says, I hear you got some questions about my book. Yeah, come on in. What about page 47, the second paragraph? You made this statement. Would you, would you explain that to me? And so the author of the book says, sit down. I'll tell you all about it. Brothers and sisters, the author of the Bible lives on the inside of us. He's come to dwell within us in any passage of Scripture you don't understand. He's more than willing to make it alive and real to you. Wow. Having the author live inside you. Wherever you go, he goes. He'll teach you while you're walking around in the park. He'll teach you while you're driving. He'll teach you while you're sweeping the floor. He'll, he'll talk to you and reveal things to you while you're taking out the trash and doing dishes. Amen. He don't care what you're doing. As long as you're listening, he'll talk to you. Praise God. All things written concerning the church must be fulfilled. And then if you go back just a couple pages to Luke 21, 22. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now that's the time you and I are living in. We're living in the days of vengeance. Now that's a strong word. And Jesus said, and he explained what the days of vengeance is. It's that all things that are written would be fulfilled. We, I think we used the illustration last week. It'll bear repeating here a little bit. That uh, let's, say, let's say our sister here is under attack of the enemy and, and she's sick. And so there's, there, you know, she's being oppressed by an evil spirit. Well, when the Lord heals her, the evil spirit is pushed away. She's healed, but while she's healed, God's taken vengeance on the enemy. So what's a victory to you is a negative for the enemy. And God is, that word vengeance is strong. I mean, God is coming with such, such emphasis and such uh, oomph in his emotions and his desire to bless his people. These are the days of vengeance. And I want you to remind the enemy this week, as you're standing in faith for your promises, just let him know, these are the days of vengeance. You're had. This is it for you, buddy. You can just send your saddle home. The victory belongs to me. Hallelujah. These are the days of vengeance. That is a good verse. Praise God. So, in order for that to happen, we've done a track. We've talked about how the Bible's inspired. God preserved it. He's translated it, and now out of, his, out of his vengeance, out of God's integrity, he's fulfilling what he has written and what he has promised us. Let's go to the new things today. Let's go to Romans chapter 9. That's a, a recap. Let's go into Romans 9 and look at the new things that the Lord has for us. Romans 9 and 28. Boy, if you don't have this verse marked, you may want to mark this one today, just like the Luke one on the day of vengeance. Romans 9 and 28. 
Romans 9, 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Let's read that again. There's a lot in this verse. For he will finish the work. Let's camp out there. He will finish the work. God never starts a project unless he knows that he can finish it. That tells me that the work that God started in you, he knows that he can finish it. He knows that he has more than enough grace, more than enough resources to finish the good work he started in you. Anybody, anybody here has ever experienced God working on you? Is God working on you? He's working on me. I like to think about what am I going to look like when God's done with me? Better get my autograph now. <laughs> What am I going to look like? What are you going to look like? What are you going to be like when God finishes the good work he started in you? Now, we know from Scripture that we're all predestined to be made like unto Jesus. Our Master, our Savior, we're going to be like him in character. But there's some little nuances because of your personality, because of your giftings and your anointings and your personality traits, there's going to be no one in all of eternity, there will be nobody like you. So what will you look like? What will you be like when God's finished with you? He will finish the work. I don't know if you've had a rough week. I don't know if you've stumbled and you've fallen and you've yielded temptation or not. But I'm telling you, don't be discouraged because God is finishing the work he started in you. Hmm, makes me want to run around the room. Glory to God right there. I think I preached myself happy already. God is finishing the work that he started in you. Mm. You realize that God looked at you and he saw all of your mistakes, all of your weaknesses, all of your failures, all of the struggles, and he says, um, I think I can work with that. I think I can do something there. I don't, that, doesn't, that doesn't discourage me because I see, see their weaknesses. I know how many times you're going to fail on that area again and again and again. And you know, it just doesn't put me off because I think I got more than enough grace to take care of that. Hallelujah. He will finish the work. And cut it short in righteousness. He will cut it short in righteousness. God will finish the work that he's begun in you in righteousness. When it comes to completion, it will be completed in his righteousness. Now watch the wording on this. Watch this, please. For he will finish the work and, what's the next three words? Cut it short. Say, cut it short. Say it again. Cut it short in what? Righteousness. Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. You guys know my testimony. You know I've been in church all my life. Well, ever since I can rem remember, and I've talked to so many Christians, they're looking for a shortcut. Looking for a shortcut. I found it. I found the shortcut. It's righteousness. Righteousness. Because he's going to cut it short in righteousness. So our new series is Righteousness, Shortcut to Victory. Righteousness, Shortcut to Victory. This is part three. Righteousness, Shortcut to Victory. This is the shortcut. And I'm going to talk to you over the next few weeks about righteousness and how in his righteousness he fulfills his word and that he's going to cut it short, make a quick work in righteousness. How many here? Okay, we'll do that, Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. How many here has, by a show of hands, how many here has ever been discouraged about spiritual progress? Can I see your hand? Okay. Has anybody ever been discouraged lately over the last couple of weeks about it? Okay? All right, everybody look up here. Your answer is righteousness. Because that's how he's going to finish the work, and he's going to do a quick work, is he's going to do it in his righteousness. 
So as opposed to being discouraged the next time the devil comes and he begins to whisper in your ear that you're not going to make it and it's not worth all that time and all that effort, you might as well just forget it. Just give up. Just give up. Just give up. Just give up. It's not working. 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 You might as well give up. It's not working. You can say to him, stop, stop. Got a word for you, Mr. Devil. Righteousness. Righteousness. My God is going to finish it in righteousness. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The shortcut of righteousness. Now, let me give you a principle. I want you to write this down, and then I'll, I'll show it to you. Okay, I'll show it to you in the Word. Please write this down. This is important. This is a great nugget. God starts in your life by words. God starts in your life by words, but He brings you to finish by doing. God starts in your life by words, but he brings you to finish by doing. That is a powerful life principle with the Lord. God starts in your life by words, but he brings you to finish by doing. Now let me give you a verse to prove that. Let's go to Genesis 21, please. Genesis 21 and verse 1. Now, this principle you'll find all throughout the scriptures. And I chose this one because this is a, a verse God gave to me. And it just is a good, good verse to prove the principle. Genesis 21 and 1. God starts in your life by words, but he brings you to finish by doing. Man, that's exciting. Genesis 21.1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Genesis 21, 1, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Do you see the principle there? that God starts in your life by words, but he brings you to finish by doing. This is what we're talking about. And we can see the importance of being in the word of God and getting some good preaching and teaching and being open to hear from God because when God wants to do something in your life, he begins to speak promises. He begins to reveal the word to you over and over and over again. And so as opposed to being flippant and saying, well, I'll get to that later. No, no, what we got to do is we got to hold fast to that word because that's God starting the work but he's going to finish by doing and he's going to complete it in righteousness. So we, we, we cannot take a flippant, careless attitude about the word. That's the start of the process. But you and I are living in the time of the days of vengeance where God is going to bring to pass. He's going to do. We're going to see God do what he said he would do. I'm sticking around. <laughs> I'm not quitting now. I've been in this my whole life. I'm not quitting now. We're right on the edge of the greatest miracles, the greatest victories ever. I would be stupid to just go this far and say, oh, I think I'll quit. Say what? <laughs> not happening. What great times. Hallelujah. The Lord did as he had spoken. Now, the Lord's righteousness is taking what's wrong in your life and making it right. The Lord's righteousness is God taking what's wrong in your life and making it right. What was wrong with Sarah? She was barren. That's not God's will for her. That's not God's will for any woman to be barren. So God in his righteousness... He released the force of righteousness and he took what was wrong with her, which was a barren womb, and he made her fruitful. Right, the, God, the God's righteousness is God taking what's wrong in your life and making it right. Now, please don't answer out loud. What's wrong in your life right now? What areas of your life are wrong and stubborn and won't seem to change? You need to speak righteousness to it. You need to speak the righteousness of God and release the force of righteousness into that area because God's righteousness takes what's wrong and makes it right. 
Hallelujah. You guys are thinking that one through. Hallelujah. Now, Romans, stay right here. Romans 9, 28, we just read the verse. That God will finish the work. He will cut it short in righteousness for a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Now, I want to give you another principle, very important. God gave me that verse twice. A life worth living is a life worth recording. A life worth living is a life worth recording. You need to record, you need to write down the scriptures and the promises that God gives you. What I do is I put a circle around the verse number and I put the, the date over on the uh, side column that, that the, the date that that verse was given to me. You need to keep track of the promises of God. And at the very beginning of my Bible, I've written down the date and the, the scripture reference. And I put at the top the word of the Lord. So I go through and I refeed my spirit every promise God's given me. A life worth living is a life worth recording. Now, here's the deal. When you are writing down and keeping record of what God has given you, when God speaks a verse to you twice, there is a reason for that. And it is a very important reason. One of the attributes of God, one of his characteristics that we see throughout all of the word of God is that God will say something twice. Let me give you a simple example. How, how many of you remember when Samuel was a little boy and he was, with, he was living with uh, the prophet and the Lord spoke to him and said, Samuel, Samuel. God called his name twice. So Samuel gets up, he goes to the prophet, and the prophet says, I didn't say anything, go lie down. So the little boy goes, lies down, God says, Samuel, Samuel, calls his name twice again. Goes back to the prophet, the prophet says, you know, I think God might be speaking to you, boy. Next time God says that to you, you just be still and say, speak, Lord, for your servant's listening. So Samuel goes back to bed, and sure enough, God calls his name twice. When God says something twice, when God gives you a verse twice, there is an extremely important reason why. I want you to see that in Genesis 40, um, Genesis 41. Genesis 41 and 32. A life worth living is a life worth recording. Is your life worth living? Hmm? Is your life worth living? Then it's worth recording. Genesis 41, 32. Joseph is speaking to Pharaoh. He says, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. That's why you need to keep record of what God speaks to you. You need to keep good track record of the verses he gives you because if God comes back around six months or a year later, or two years later, three years later and gives you the same verse, you know <clears throat> something's up here. This thing is established by God. Brothers and sisters, if it's established by God, <clears throat> there's nothing the devil can do to stop it. It's established, and it will shortly come to pass. Is that good? I hope that encourages you like it does me. If, God's given, if God gives you a dream in the night and he gives you the same dream twice, if you have a vision from God and it's twice, you know what it is right here. If somebody comes up to you and hands you a $20 bill and three or four days later somebody else comes up and hands you a $20 bill, God is saying something to you. Something is about to happen in your finances. It's been established, and now it's going to shortly 
take place. We gotta watch for the signs. We gotta watch for the, the way God moves. In the coming move of God, are we gonna miss it or are we gonna catch it and go with it? Well, in order to go with it, we gotta understand the monikers. We gotta understand how God moves. This is one of his primary ways right here is he does something twice. So when the devil comes along and he says, well, you know, you've been standing out for quite a while. I mean, it's been four and a half months. Hold up. Stop with the unbelief. Mr. Devil, God gave it to, to me twice. Let me read you, Mr. Devil, Genesis 41. It's already established, and it won't be long. Amen? Amen. You've got to preach to the devil. Let's go, please, to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah 9 and 8. As you go to Nehemiah 9 and 8, I'll share with you one of my pet peeves as a minister. And that is... <clears throat> I wish more Christians would have the books of the Bible memorized. I wish more Christians would have the books of the Bible memorized. I told a lady one time, I said, I'll give you $50 if you memorize the books of the Bible. She did not, and I did not. It's important to have the books of the Bible memorized. Okay, moving right along. <clears throat> Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. See, it'll help you out there. See how easy it is when you have them memorized? They got these little bookmarks with the books of the Bible. Just put that on your refrigerator, and every time you go to get milk, just read them out loud. Hallelujah. Nehemiah 9. Let's read verse 7, please. Thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose Abram, and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gavest him the name of Abraham, and foundest his heart faithful before thee, and madest a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the, the, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it, I say, to his seed, and hast performed thy words for thou art righteous. Look at the last part of that. And hast performed thy words, for thou art righteous. God's righteousness is him performing his word. God's righteousness is him performing his word. I was raised mainly in the word of faith circles and we were taught about righteousness, that it means no guilt and no condemnation, and that we have right standing with God, and all of that's true, and we're going to get into that in this series. But that's the second side of the coin. The first side is, <clears throat> excuse me, is that God's righteousness is that he has such integrity that he performs his word. God does not lie. God cannot lie. If God makes a promise, it's good. Amen? In his righteousness, he performs his word. Now, I know I'm being a little repetitive, but I want you to get the, the boxcars on the train. Inspiration, preservation, translation, fulfillment. How is that fulfillment taking place? In his righteousness, God performs his word. I believe that because the Bible is inspired, preserved, translated... All of that is so that God can reveal his righteousness to us by bringing it to pass. What good is the book, and I don't mean this sacrilegiously, but what good is the book if God doesn't perform his word? It's a book of lies. There's no truth in it if God doesn't come through with the goods. So God in his righteousness performs his word. In the book of Job 23, please. Job 23 and 14. Job 
Job 23, 14. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me. You cannot perform the word. God can, and he will. And God will perform that thing that is appointed for you. Now, what is it that is appointed for you? All of those scriptures concerning the church, all of those promises that God's made to you, all those verses he's made real to you, that is the thing that is appointed for you, and he will perform it. And I find this last phrase interesting and many such things are with him that's like God just added a little room another door and opened up for us a, a room here and it's like what does that mean Lord what does that mean that many and many such things like that are with him what does that mean I don't know yet but I'm looking to find out but it's intrigued me. It's raised my eyebrow because God is not limited to just one thing. There are many things that he can do. We get too, too narrow, too tunnel vision that if God's going to bless me, it has to be just like this. I remember as a teenage boy growing up, I wanted to be just like my pastor. And I asked God, I said, God, I want you to bless me just like my pastor. I want the same kind of car. I want the same kind of house. I want to comb my hair and look just like him. I want to be, ju I want, I wanted to be a clone. Now, I was 14, so you've got to understand my, my immaturity. But it, sometimes it takes a while to grow out of the spiritual immaturity. We see how God blesses somebody else and we go, oh, God, that's what I want. I want you to bless me just like that. And God says, well, I'll bless you, but I kind of had some other things in mind. I kind of wanted to come around at this angle and because I know you and I know what you really like. You think you'd really like the, the brand new Mercedes Benz, but what you would really like is a brand new such and such. And I was going to come at it at a different angle. Let's allow God to bless us the way he wants to. Amen? Let's give him some room to work. I'm not saying we can't be specific with our faith, but we need to let him have room to work. He performeth. This is his righteousness. Righteousness is the nature of God. It's who he is. God is righteous. God is the one who performs his word. In Job 33, please. Job 33 and 26. <clears throat> Let's back up to verse 24. We'll read 24, 25, and 26. Then he is gracious unto him and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Who would that be? Hmm? Jesus, according to the book of Matthew. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him. And he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. When God answers your prayers, that is God rendering unto you his righteousness. When you pray, you get an answer. Your face is full of joy. You're excited. You're blessed. You're thankful. You're happy. That is God rendering unto you his righteousness. Hallelujah. Proverbs 23, please. 
Proverbs 23 and 18. Proverbs 23 and 18. <clears throat> For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. That's a good verse. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Sometimes you think, God, I've been standing for years. God, I've just been standing in faith, and God, will it ever happen? Will it ever happen? God, when's it going to happen? God, how long do I have to wait? For surely there is an end. You're not going to have to wait forever. You're not going to have to wait forever. Surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Brothers and sisters, it's coming. You and I are one day closer to manifestation. We're just one day closer. You know, the devil says, well, just mark another, another red X through the calendar. It's another day gone by. And you go, yeah. That's right. Another day's gone by. I'm one day closer to manifestation. God is performing his word. His righteousness is at work in my life, and I am not going to have to wait forever. Surely there is an end. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 4. Classic verse of scripture. It's hard to teach on righteousness without talking about Abraham. Romans 4. Romans 4, 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. <clears throat> And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. I saw something new out of these two verses. The last few weeks I had never seen before as much as I had gone over this. I, this is one of my favorite passages in the Word. Being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. In that you see God starting with words and finishing by doing. But for a long time I read that verse and I thought, I don't get it. What's the big deal? Abraham thought God was big enough. He had enough muscle power. He had enough strength to do what he promised. And I thought, that's not great faith. Just about anybody who knows, you know, just a little bit about God thinks, well, if he's God, he can do anything. I mean, he's got all power. So I didn't quite understand what was the big deal but then in the light of this, it came to me like this. Abraham was fully persuaded in God's righteousness and that faith made him righteous. He believed that God was righteous, that God had integrity, that he had enough righteousness about him to bring it to pass. It wasn't about muscle power. It was about God's integrity. It was about his character. And it says, therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. And I got this nugget. Our righteousness is to believe. His righteousness is to perform. Our righteousness is to believe. His righteousness is to perform. Now, you cannot believe until God first speaks. But once God has spoken, then we have a choice. I've got a choice. I, either I can believe God or I can go, nope, I choose not to believe that and turn and walk away. But if I choose to believe God then God considers me righteous. 
I'm now in right standing with him because I believe that he is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. He will make it good. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Hallelujah. In Isaiah 32, we find this verse about righteousness. Isaiah 32 and 17. Our righteousness is to believe. His righteousness is to perform. God will not do your believing for you. And you cannot perform the word. Only he can do that. Let me tell you something I've learned about God. Sister Jeannie, I've learned something about God. He will not move when it's your turn. You'll wait, and 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 you just keep on waiting. And if it's your turn to move, then God's not going to move until you move. God requires faith. He requires that we believe and hold fast to his word, that we speak his word, that we speak to the mountain, that we speak to circumstances. And as we do our part, then God is faithful to do his part. In Isaiah 32, 17, the Bible says, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. One more time. The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Righteousness removes uncertainty. Righteousness removes uncertainty. I find that Christians struggle with uncertainty. I don't know if you realize this, but the book of Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, tells us that that's a curse. When you wake up in the morning wringing your hands wishing it were evening, and in the evening you were wringing your hands wishing it was morning and there's no uncertainty in your life, the Bible calls that a curse and that reveals to us that that person is not established in righteousness. Because when you know that God is righteous, when you know that you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, uncertainty leaves your life. Pinpoint it. Let's dial it home. Let's get closer. What areas of your life are you uncertain about? You need some righteousness scriptures. Because righteousness will take that away. God does not want, nor is he pleased with his children living a life of uncertainty. Have you, have you ever met the guy who is always famous for saying, well, now I just don't know about that. Well, now, I just don't know about that either. Well, now, I don't know about that, and you just never know. And that's all that comes out of that person's mouth? They know little to nothing about righteousness. Because when you know about your righteousness, you are certain. You are certain. You may not know how all of the, the intricate details and how God's going to work it out, but when you are in faith and you are established in righteousness, you are like God. You know the end from the beginning. And my wife and I encourage, encourage each other all the time. We'll, always, we'll look at each other and say, well, we know how this is going to turn out. We know It may look bad now. We may have gotten a bad report, but we know how this is going to turn out. We know how this is going to turn out. It's going to be interesting to watch God work, but we know the end from the beginning because God has given us his word. He's promised us, so we know how it's going to turn out. Brothers and sisters, if you know the end from the beginning, there should be no uncertainty in your life. Don't, preach me, oh, don't shout me down when I'm preaching real good, Brother Hagin used to say. There should be no uncertainty in your life. You need to be rooted and grounded and established in your righteousness and in God's righteousness. God will not lie to you. Hallelujah. Righteousness removes uncertainty. Read the verse again, please. 
and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Look at these three words, peace, quietness, and assurance. I'm telling you, if you could put that in a bottle and sell it, you'd be a billionaire in 10 days. Those are three things the world has not, and they cannot offer you peace, quietness, and assurance. They do not have it. But we, the people of God, should have it in abundance, and it's available in our righteousness with him. Hallelujah. Just a few more, please. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32 and 27. Jeremiah 32, 27. Is that not a great verse on righteousness? Isaiah 32, 17. But we're in Jeremiah, or going there. Jeremiah 32, 27. Say it with me. Our God is a righteous God. He never fails. He always performs his word. Our God is a righteous God. He can never fail his people. In Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Now let's answer that question. Is there anything too hard for God? Are you sure about that? Are you sure? Come on, help me preach this. Are you sure that there's nothing too hard for God? Then why would you worry? Why would you lose sleep? Why would you be anxious? If there's nothing too hard for him, then why would you be full of fear? Why would you have care and worry if your God is the God of all flesh, and there's nothing too hard for him. Yeah, but... <laughs> Here comes the unbelief. Yeah, but, Brother Phil, I know he can, but I'm not sure he will. That means you don't know his righteousness. God would rather you say to him, God, you don't have enough power. I just don't think you can do that. He'd rather you think that and say that about him as opposed to this. God, I know you have the power. I'm just not sure that you love me enough. I'm just not sure that you really care that much about me. That's not knowing his righteousness. <clears throat> a few years ago, I was doing some study, and I was doing this and doing that. I'm sitting in my office, in my, uh, in, at my desk in my office, and the, the Lord spoke to me. And he said to me, how would you like to become my friend? And I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God. I put my hands up. I said, oh, God. I, I, I want to be your friend. God, I want to be your friend. He asked me again, how would you like to be my friend? Man, I'm, I'm starting to cry. I'm like, God, I, God, I, I want to be your best friend. I want to, God, I know you're my friend, but I want to be your friend. God, that's, that's the longing of my heart. That, if there was any one phrase to describe my heart, God, I, I want to be your friend. He said, you really want to be my friend? I said, oh, God, I want to be your friend. He said, I require something of my friends. I go, okay. But before he answered me, he said this. He said, you need to understand, I have many sons and daughters, but I have very few friends. Oh, man. I'm like, I'm like melting all over the place. I'm just like, that hurt. He goes, I got a lot of sons and daughters, but I have very few friends. What do you say? And what do you say to God when he says that to you? And I'm, my hands are up, and Leanne's at work, so I'm just boohooing in God, you know, I'm just. 
So what's it take? He said, in order to be my friend, you have to believe me for outlandish things. That's the word he used. He said, you have to believe me for outlandish things. And then he took me through and he started with Abraham and Sarah. He said, do you realize how outlandish it is for two old people to believe to have a kid? Never, never heard of, never done before, and they're calling themselves mom and dad, mom and pop. She's been barren her whole life. She's past her prime. He's past his. And they're believing. They're saying, God said we're going to have a son. Right. Sure. And you track it all through the Bible. The people that believe God for outlandish things, the Bible calls that person God's friend. Now, God cautioned me. He said, if you want to be my friend, you're going to have to believe me for outlandish things. But it's not something you choose. You don't just arbitrarily go, hey, God, I got a great idea. Make me a billionaire by tomorrow. It doesn't work like that. It has to be the outlandish thing that he has for you. This is outlandish. To believe that a guy would born with a birth defect would have his hand recreated, that's outlandish. I talk to people about my hand, and you can just see the unbelief. They're respectful. They won't say anything, but it's like they just kind of backpedal. You can tell. I was at a place last year, and I went forward for prayer, and there were these two guys. They're going to pray. So what do you want? I said, well, God promised me he had to uh, he'd recreate my hand. Why don't you guys pray for my hand? And one guy looked at him and goes, uh, you want to pray for that one? <laughs> Choke him. In order to be the friend of God, you have to believe him for something outlandish. But it has to be that thing that he reveals to you. But once he reveals it to, to you, what God is doing, then he's inviting you to come in and be his friend. The Bible says of Abraham that he is God's forever friend. Not just a friend, he's forever the friend of God. The Bible says that Moses was the friend of God and that God and Moses spoke face to face. That's pre-cross, pre-Jesus coming. Is anything too hard for God? He will challenge you. He will challenge you. Been studying faith for years, but that's not enough with him. He says, boy, it's time to get out and walk on the water. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm feeling the bottom of my feet getting wet. <laughs> it's more than book learning. It's a life that you live. And your faith goes to a God who is righteous. He starts with words. He, he finishes by doing. He is a God of integrity. He will not lie. He cannot lie. But you have to believe him beyond everything the natural circumstances are saying to you. The natural will scream at you, you're crazy. You're nuts. It's not working. It's not going to work. But in your heart, you know that you know that you and God are getting to be close buddies because you're believing him for some crazy stuff. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's go to Numbers, please. Numbers 23. Numbers 23. How many here want to be the friend of God? Hallelujah. Well, okay, Lord. I, <laughs> the Lord's not going to let us get by with that. By a show of hands... How many here want to be the friend of God? Just want you to know that God saw that. Just want you to know God saw that, because that was done by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He will be tapping on your shoulder. He will be talking to you in the middle of the night. He will be talking to you as you go down the highway of life, and he'll begin to speak to you. And if you're in a car, you may have to pull over to the side of the road and cry for a little bit. But it's your opportunity to know God like you have never known him before. I'm hungry for that. I'm hungry for that. 
Numbers 23, 14. How about 23, 19? <laughs> Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Here's another verse that proves to us God starts in your life by words, but he brings you to finish by doing because you have the word spoken and make it good in this verse here. God will not, he cannot lie to you. I want to just blast unbelief out of your heart and away from you and off of you and just infuse you with faith today that God who has begun a good work in you will finish it. And he will do it in righteousness. It will be a quick work. Now, now God gave me a little nugget with that with Romans 9. He said that he would do a quick work, cut it short in righteousness. He said, son, I want you to understand that the work I'm doing in you, I'm going to bring it to completion. It's not going to be completed on Tuesday, and the rapture is going to happen on Wednesday. He said, I'm going to give you time to enjoy it. You're going to get to live. I'm going to bring you to a place of a finish, and then you're going to enjoy. You're going to have a season of enjoying what I've done in your life before I catch away the church. He's good. He's just a good God. Hallelujah. Our final verse is Luke chapter 1. This is one of my favorite faith verses. This one verse, Luke 1, 45, just puts in a nice capsule form the faith life. Luke 1, 45. This is a verse that you want to be said about you. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth are together. Elizabeth is speaking to her by unction, inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And in Luke 1.45, Elizabeth says to Mary this, And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. That's the faith life right there. You want to be blessed? Believe that God will perform the thing that he told you. And for people who say that God doesn't use women, you've got to be kidding me. This is the ultimate right here. Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. As we close, I want you to understand that right now, while we're here in this, this room, that God is working on your behalf. It doesn't just show up in manifestation, manifestation and go, oh, look what God did today. No, no, God's been working on it. Angels have been released. Angels are on assignment. God is speaking to people's hearts. He's changing the way they think. God is moving and rearranging, and God is working on your case. And he will bring you to completion. And when it's done, you're going to lift up your hands and you're going to say, Oh, you are so righteous. You are so righteous. And I am not just your son or daughter. I'm one of your best friends. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you for listening to this CD and being a part of the voice of faith. Until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words, be not afraid, only believe.